it, it's a pleasure to be here. She said about 10 years. It's uh, 10 years, April 12th, this coming April 12th. So it's very close to 10 years. I also want to apologize for canceling in November, but I found the day before or the day of the talk that I could say about five words and then not get any more air out. And I'd made about five trips or in seven or eight weeks to Asia and uh, pneumonia caught up with me. So, but I have a voice today and I, I will use it and uh, I'm really glad to be here. So this is the 30 meter telescope in digital rendering on the summit area of uh, Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, the world's best telescopes, there's the two Keck telescopes, the Subaru eight meter, uh, Gemini North, Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. You're looking at one of the two capitals on Earth of optical and infrared astronomy. There's other kinds of astronomy there. It's a marvelous location. And one of the key things I learned when I came from LIGO to the world of telescopes was you need to have a column of air in front of you that preserves as much that plane wave that's coming into the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And having a lot of temperature variations in that column of air above you doesn't help. And what a wonderful thing, a, a conical piece of rock in the middle of a big isothermal bath with air passing over it. It's, so it's not an accident that a place like this is such a marvelous place uh, for astronomy. We also studied, when I first came, we were studying, and George Dorogovsky, I saw him here, was a, imp, a, instrumental in getting our study. We used five robotic telescopes on, on uh, uh, mountains in Chile and Mexico. Warren Skidmore is here, too, to look at the quality of the, that column of air above us. And the mountain that we didn't use in Chile is being used by the European Extremely Large Telescope. So uh, that work was very useful in the, uh, looking forward to the Extremely Large Telescope. So there we are at nearly 14,000 feet. Uh, even with this wonderful air column above us, we need to use adaptive optics, and I'll say something about that. This is what the observatory looks like in a digital rendering. There's the telescope in there, 30 meters in diameter, primary mirror made up of segments like the Keck telescope, 492 segments, all optically phased to about 15 nanometers under, under, under computer control, and I'll show you the hardware and so on that goes uh, to make that possible. And uh, this dome is uh, very large, and of course you don't want to lift a huge heavy shutter over it, so it's kind of a novel design which, which it rotates about its azimuth and then about an inclined ring girder to make it very efficient uh, and, and very balanced. So that's what the observatory looks like from the outside. The telescope itself, uh, 30 meters across, this is the primary mirror, this is the secondary mirror, and then there's a tertiary mirror which can direct the beam onto instruments on these two platforms called Naismith platforms. And something like a, about eight instruments can be accommodated on those platforms. So I like that because it reminded me of the accelerator floors at fixed target accelerators where over 50 years there was a constant coming and going of instruments instead of hanging them in very constrained places on the telescope. This thing is big, 56 meters high. And to give you a bit of a ruler, I took one of the renderings and did my best to stick it next to Millikan. So if you walked over to Millikan and looked up, you get an idea of how large this telescope is when it's, when it's zenith pointing. Um, and of, of course, the key parameter, we call it the 30 meter telescope. This is part of the wonderful historical trend that was pioneered around here, uh, very much starting with Hale's, uh, uh, you know, when Hale came from the 40 uh, inch Yerkes refractor to the 60 inch on Mount Wilson, the 100 inch on Mount Wilson, the 200 inch. Uh, at Palomar and then the Keck telescope in 1992. And, and this size matters because you can collect light, but you can also achieve a better diffraction limited resolution. So one of the things we commonly show, and I think Judy Cohen was the person who uh, provided, provided this, um, um, no, Mike Bolte provided this. This is a Hubble Deep Field Galaxy. And if you resolve this with the resolution of a two and a half meter Hubble mirror, it looks something like this. Uh, sitting down on Mauna Kea with a 30 meter telescope, you get something like this. So it's clearly a tremendous advantage. And of course, it only works if you have adopt adaptive optics working uh, to achieve diffraction limited resolution. So for those of you who don't think about telescopes, uh, uh, clearly the diameter squared matters. Uh, it allows you to collect light and see farther and fainter, but the, but the adaptive optics is really key. And, and TMT is being designed from the beginning as an adaptive optic system. Um, this quote, in fact, that was pointed out, I think, by, uh, by Judy. Here's Hale. He's just bringing on, in 1908, the 60-inch. 
and he's already designing the 100 inch, which came on in 1918, and he's, he's figured out that engineers can do pretty good things with optics and mechanical problems, okay? But he doesn't know what to do about atmospheric disturbances, and he's looking forward saying that somewhere that, that's going to get solved. And of course, uh, we now are at a point where not only do we have adaptive optics, but it's being increasingly used in, in astronomy, and I'll show a plot that indicates that. Um, the sensitivity with a 30 meter telescope, the, clearly you'd go as d squared, uh, the number of nights an astronomer has to spend on a mountain uh, uh, is, it, you get more efficient by d squared uh, as a seeing limited observation without adaptive optics, but this goes as d to the fourth for, with adaptive optics, so it's a very powerful, productive uh, instrument. When I came to TMT, uh, to TMT in 2004, uh, one of the activities that was really uh, going on was looking at the science uh, program that was envisioned for TMT. And I have to say, with LIGO, when we came, of course, we, 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 we imagined uh, binary in spirals and stochastic sources. There was a small number of sources, but the key science driving requirement was this, this noise uh, curve and uh, understanding the amplitude and phase uh, sensitivity that you needed and trying to understand the, the noise. The science case, uh, the science requirements and how they flow down to engineering requirements for LIGO is relatively simple compared to the, to the case here. So the science advisory committee was already in motion. They'd been working for a year to look at, uh, you know, all of the various science cases then in 2004. And of course, that's periodically been re-looked at along the way, and if you look at science cases over a, uh, a wide range of parameters, you should develop science requirements that result in robust engineering requirements as science evolves over the, uh, over the years it takes to realize the observatory. So a, si a set of science cases were, were envisioned, and they, and they of course needed adaptive optics uh, to fully uh, uh, address the science, and then studies were, uh, capabilities were defined in that original um, uh, study what kinds of instruments were needed to address these various physics uh, and, and astronomy topics. And uh, you can see these here. And among those, three of those instruments, they were first outlined as, as uh, capabilities, uh, but they've now uh, become designs for specific instruments. Are, these are included in the first light suite of instruments uh, for TMT. And I mentioned those large Naismith platforms, which can accommodate future instruments uh, as the program evolves. Um, all this stuff, science case, requ science-based requirements, observatory requirements are on the web, the tmt.org uh, 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 website. And, and in fact, much of the design is, is on the web. Uh, you could build a lot of the things in TMT from what's what's on the web. We also looked at uh, how these instrumental capabilities in red would compare to the capabilities in uh, JWST and ANALMA. And it's interesting to see that uh, down at a couple of microns, uh, TMT is a little bit like ANALMA. So I've, I've talked to you, but the first thing that I confronted when I came was the, uh, the system engineering that starts with science cases defining capabilities packaging them into instrument suites, and it resulted in a science requirements documents, the document, the customer requirements. And we carried out a set of uh, studies over a couple of years, and which resulted in instrument designs to reach those capabilities, and that helped us develop the top of our um, system engineering tree, the observatory requirements doc document, the architecture, and the operational requirements document. And uh, well, I think one of the strengths of the TMT project is uh, is the interaction between the science uh, uh, advisory committee and the, and the large engineering team working on this. Uh, so what I've described is the initial establishment of the engineering requirements, but in fact this loop is, is, in, is in constant uh, uh, exercise. We have had for years a weekly meeting with the leaders from each institution of the science advisory committee, and now that we've gone international, it's bi-weekly. And as design things come up and you can't reach this parameter or that looks hard or that thing looks too expensive, there's a constant interaction with the science uh, advisory committee. I think that's a remarkable feature of this project. We broke down the science uh, parameters, all of the things that you need to be able to do all the science into a set of parameters and built an enormous matrix, of which this is probably a few percent of the matrix. I couldn't show it all. 
And so, in fact, uh, the science flow down is very well mapped out. And as uh, designers work on things and see that, that they can't achieve this parameter or that, it's fairly obvious what the impact is on science. And of course, there's consultation with the Science Advisory Committee. But uh, I think a very good job has been done on the, on the, on the uh, scientific aspect of the system engineering. And then we follow in TMT a full system engineering process, and, and we use object-oriented uh, uh, techniques and tools to manage our, our requirements and guide the design. So this is the observatory without the enclosure. There's your, the 30-meter uh, mirror. And I've said there's a secondary mirror here and a tertiary mirror, which is articulated. It can rotate and, and change its angle so that uh, uh, we can move very rapidly the beam onto any one of the instruments. And in fact, we can go f in five minutes from uh, observing on one instrument to acquiring and observing on another instrument. For a telescope that weighs without instruments 2,000 tons, that kind of agility is, uh, is impressive. But it's, it, it's needed in order to really use the time at night and in order to be able to react to transient objects. So there are instruments on the Naismith platforms. There's an alignment and phasing system, which is really an instrument to, uh, being designed up at, at JPL to, to allow us to phase the mirror so that all these 492 segments are, are phased uh, optically. There's a facility adaptive optic system that can accommodate three instruments on it, and I'll say something about those uh, a little bit later. There's a uh, leading sci uh, seeing limited non-adaptive optics instrument is accommodated over here, and there's room for these other instruments. We also launch off the top of the secondary mirror uh, guide star laser beams. And I'll say a little bit about uh, guide star laser assisted adaptive optics uh, in a few moments. This thing is enclosed, of course, in this dome, this uh, novel design, uh, mechanical design for this dome. And the function of a dome, again, for people who don't work with telescopes and being in the gravitational wave community, this may be as unfamiliar to you as it was to me. Um, it's not just a way to keep the telescope protected during the day and night, but one of the goals is to maintain a constant temperature airflow, an air column, in front of that primary mirror during the night. And you'll see a little bit more about the design of that uh, as I come to it, I come to the uh, discussion of the enclosure. So I've already mentioned that this thing is very agile. You can uh, go from uh, uh, to a, an instrument that you're not observing with in five minutes and be observing. And if you look at the kinds of time scales that are needed to follow transient uh, uh, things like GRBs, you can see that five minutes is, is quite advantageous in this. That's just an example. Now I want to play this a couple of times. In fact, I'll, I'll back up. Um, look at the center of our galaxy with a seeing limited telescope. And you just see a very large image. Look at it with adaptive optics as it's being, been looked at for a number of years with Keck. And you can see the nearest stars to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy orbiting there. And you, that, that's a pretty good indication when you look at those orbits that you have a very heavy object there. And so I'm going to show a little video clip uh, taken from the work done at Keck by Andrea Gez. There's similar work uh, done at the VLT in Chile um, of a movie made with Keck and adaptive optics, where you can see the trajectories of these, uh, of these stars and then show you what it would look like uh, from TMT. And in fact, uh, with TMT, one ought to be able to see these trajectories well enough to see general relativistic effects. And so here's the seeing limited center. And then there's an image, a little movie taken by Keck, and if you look at some of these trajectories, you'll see very quick transits, transits as they get close. Okay, now look at the same thing with TMT. The center is there. Okay, so um, that's the closest I'm going to get to general relativity in this talk. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, the star is mapping out the embedding diagram around the center uh, supermassive black hole. Here's another image of a, of a galactic center with uh, image, this IRIS instrument, which is the diffraction limited instrument. I think I see Anna Moore back there, the co-PI. There she is on this instrument. And you can see diffraction rings around, uh, around the images here. 
So let's talk a little bit about the tech technology and the engineering on this, uh, on this telescope. This is the dome that I've talked about. You notice that it's got a bunch of vent doors. It's got a circular aperture, which is the minimum aperture that, uh, that you have, so you're not vignetting, and yet, and yet being not a rectangular aperture, you're really protecting the telescope as well as you can. In fact, we've put an aerodynamic feature on there that helps us get the right airflow over it. Uh, and I'll show a, a, a picture about that in a second. And then there's all these vent doors that can open up at night so that you are assured of having a, a nighttime temperature, constant te uh, temperature airflow across the air in front of the primary mirror. Again, we don't want any of these index of refraction fl fluctuations uh, that will uh, reduce the sharpness of our image. So this is what the dome looks like uh, in a simple solid model. And of course, there's a lot of conventional engineering. This is done by our Canadian partners. And part of the theme of my talk is that this telescope project is a little bit like a high energy collider detector. It's an international project with pieces from all over the place. And, uh, and so I've put the national flags on a lot of these. And being a dome that's going to operate at 14,000 feet in snow and ice, of course, our Canadian colleagues are very good at seeing whether the doors freeze up. But we've also done wind tunnel testing and computational fluid dynamics modeling of the telescope to make sure that we understand this nice even airflow from the vents and also high velocity winds across the aperture. What is the aerodynamics and will we, for example, be buffeting the telescope and dis disturbing the image at the telescope? And uh, that helped us set the parameters, how far back from that opening and what are the aerodynamic uh, properties around the aperture. And so this is just a one of the many, many, many images from computational fluid dynamics where you can see nice, cool colors around the secondary mirror and nice, angry looking colors just outside the dome. The telescope structure itself, you see the Japanese flag there, is being designed by Mitsubishi Electric Company in uh, Osaka. And those folks uh, did the Subaru telescope, so they're quite experienced. They also contributed some of the antennas to ALMA and uh, other astronomy projects. And so this is just a rendering of the Naismith platforms and some of the parts of it, just to show you uh, a little bit of the idea of the scale of it. And it's really quite something. You know, the mirrors, 492 mirrors to make up the primary mirrors, they have to come out once every couple of years to be stripped, recoded. OK? You have to be able to handle those things. So all of that has to be built in. You clean the CO2 snow uh, periodically to keep the mirror reflectivity up. And then there has to be a system for removing and, and, and uh, taking these things out. And uh, the amount of engineering to do all that, accomplish it safely, and not vignette uh, is uh, quite impressive. Now, the technology base for the telescope itself is, comes from Keck, from the, the segmented mirror uh, telescope technology. This is looking into the uh, Keck dome. And in fact, there are two two Keck telescopes, and some of you know that they, they were correct, connected by an interferometer. Um, this is the primary mirror of Keck with 36 segments, 1.8 meter across, and there's a, a person sticking his body out of uh, the secondary mirror opening in the primary mirror. Uh, these are Keck segments that are removed and stripped and recleaned, and there are some spares that are identical to each of the families of mirrors, so clean ones go right in during the day, and you're up again uh, that night. Observing, And this is the kind of thing we will do. Of course, with 492 segments, about once a day or so, a mirror has to come out and be stripped and recleaned. And we have 82 different kinds of mirrors. To make this hyperboloid, uh, there are families of hexes that are slightly different, and there's 82 different kinds. So we have to have 82 spares and go through a cadence of swapping out during the day. And we'll do this in groups of 10 and put 10 clean ones in and then rephase up that night. This is what a TMT segment looks like without its reflective coating. It's 1.45 meters in diameter. And I've talked so much about temperature, the temperature of the air column in front of the mirror. One of the things that happens if you have a big, heavy, warm mirror is it gets warmed up during the day. And then at night, it's cooling. And that creates uh, index of refraction fluctuations. Well, with a segmented mirror, you can make a 30 meter diameter mirror that's very thin. So it's thermally agile. You can keep this thing close to the temperature you want it to be at. So that's the TMT mirror uh, sitting there digitally rendered. And there's a person for scale. And a person can go into that support structure, the mirror cell behind, and adjust and replace uh, actuators that have failed and work on the electronics and so on. It's, uh, you shouldn't be claustrophobic, but you can do it. 
And this is a picture of me and some of the others. Jerry Nelson, the inventor of the segmented mirror telescope technology uh, for Keck, viewing the first uh, segment that was polished by Tinsley up in Richmond, California. And this is the most aspheric type of the 82 types. This is the most aspheric type, it's the hardest to polish, th thus the smiles. And we've been doing trials of polishing. We have to reestablish the supply chain. And in fact, because this is an international project, we'll be pr producing these mirrors in four countries, okay? Uh, in the US, Japan, China, and India. And they all have to be identical. So this is very much like building a high energy detector or an accelerator uh, in, a, in a global context. And it comes down to process establishment and quality control. We're also working with the European Extremely Large Telescope. And in fact, we have the same design for the segments. So the supply chains uh, could be exercised uh, by either party. And, and we've polished some of their segments. We have all their data. Our Japanese colleagues at Canon are very happy with their first Type 82 segment. And in fact, they've also learned how to put together the support system and so on. So making good progress in Japan. In China, in Nanjing, there's a laboratory uh, that's, that built uh, mirrors for a segmented mirror telescope in China, Sim simple ones, Plano and spherical mirrors. And they are working on the, the stress mirror polishing technique that uh, was pioneered by Jerry Nelson and doing trials on three segments right now in China. And similar work uh, just starting up in India. The, the prototype segment and, uh, and controls technology comes home here and there's uh, the group that's doing the primary mirror control system and the alignment and phasing system is headquartered mostly at JPL. And we also do integrated system testing at JPL. And I think Dennis Coyne served on the actuator review, one of our actuator reviews, okay. Well, all of those parts that are used to sense where a segment is and to move it and support it and so on, most of those are gonna be built in India. And you can see a whole bunch of pictures. This is an actuator. There'll be three of these on each mirror. There'll be capacitive edge sensors, six around the circumference of, a, of each mirror segment, communicating with the neighbor and uh, telling us where they are so that we can supply the right controls to correct the phasing. Uh, and prototyping is going on. This is an Indian actuator being tested here in California. The vacuum tanks for, for uh, coating India. Uh, lots of parts for the segment support assembly. Just, you know, click edge sensors in India, prototyping, testing, qualifying and so on. That's a lot of what's going on in the project. The tertiary mirror system, this three and a half meter across mirror that's highly articulated, the entire system will be done in Changchun, China by a very powerful institute there. And you can just see a picture of us after one of our external reviews. We brought external reviewers and, and reviewed what they were doing and gave them instructions on the next step. So the project is quite globalized. And in fact, even the adaptive optics system, if you just look at the adaptive optics system, is quite globalized. And the science instruments are quite globalized and in fact becoming more globalized uh, as we get down to brass tacks and make sure that uh, everything that has to be done is covered and covered within our collaboration. So that's a, uh, also a challenge in producing these one-of-a-kind instruments. So let me say a little bit uh, about adaptive optics. There may be people here who are experts in it, but when I came from LIGO, I didn't know much about what really goes on in the world of adaptive optics. Um, and so we have these three instruments, one of which will not use adaptive optics, a wide field optical spectrometer. And we have these two instruments that use a corrected beam of light from the adaptive optic system. And they're mounted on these Naismith platforms. And to do adaptive optics, of course, you want to know, have a known reference source that's sharp and take the wavefront from it analyze its distortion as it's come through the atmosphere, compute a correction to a deformable mirror, and use that on your science, on the light from your science object. And that works, and that works in a narrow cone around the reference star. There isn't always a reference star where you want to have it, and so you have to make your own stars a good fraction of the time. And we do that by launching a beam of 589 nanometer light up and about 90 or 100 kilometers up, there's a layer of sodium ions and they will fluoresce and we'll create our own stars. So this is a laser guide star assisted system. The lasers will be mounted down actually on the elevation journals and then the light will be transported up here to a launch telescope. And because we don't wanna use an adaptive optic system to make one correction around one reference star, which will create a, a correction in a narrow angular field, but we want to have a wider field correction, 
We do this, first of all, twice with two deformable mirrors conjugate to two different levels in the atmosphere, and we create a constellation around our, our science field. So we can actually do atmospheric tomography uh, assisted by these laser guide stars. So we're going to launch at first light six laser beams and may develop up to about nine of, of these uh, to do laser guide star assisted AO. So it's interesting, you, you launch off the top of the telescope and up around uh, 90 or 100 kilometers, there's a, a, a layer. And across a 30 meter mirror, you see the guide star. Of course, what you got is a 10 kilometer long sausage of light. It's not a dot. So you have this image there. And that means you'd like to have some special sensors, and I'll show those. So this uh, adaptive optic system that includes the wavefront sensors for the guide stars, the uh, uh, the deformable mirrors themselves and all the optics to collect all that and to understand which is the science light and which is the reference star light is being designed in Canada at the Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics. We'll use two deformable mirrors conjugate to the two different elevations in the atmosphere so we can do this atmospheric tomography. These are the wavefront sensors for, uh, for sensing what's coming in uncorrected. These deformable mirrors are, are uh, hard to make. We've been doing prototyping for quite a while with CELOS in France, and we're also working with Zynetics here in the United States in Massachusetts and building subscale parts and prototypes and operating them. And we want to operate at minus 30 C because we want to have low noise, so these things have to deform, but they also have to do it at minus 30 C and also calibrate with a very thin face sheet at room temperature. There's TMT spelled out with a six pixel high strip there and mounted in a tiptoe stage, stage to do another correction. So all of this stuff is being designed and, and prototyped and tested, and we're basically ready to start. Uh, uh, where we have some actuator R&D that's going on now, but uh, should be ready to start in a year to produce these deformable mirrors. Now, laser guide star assisted AO is being used in astronomy. This is a marvelous picture from the two Keck telescopes where they were looking at the galactic center uh, one night, and both telescopes were working with their laser beams going. It's, it's really a beautiful picture. It almost makes you want to be an astronomer to see a thing like that. And, uh, and I talked about the more complicated kind of guide star uh, 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 constellations. They call them asterisms. This is a Gemini South uh, telescope in Chile launching five laser beams, and they're using them uh, with, a, with a very powerful instrument now at, at Gemini South. So this kind of thing, uh, which used to be considered hard, AO, and in fact, guide star assisted AO is becoming more and more common. And you can see the number of papers just for Keck, refereed AO science papers by year and you know, distributed by kinds of astronomy. And you can also see uh, among all observatories doing this sort of thing, how it's been building up over years. Soon, I, I think I'll have the 2013 data. And you can see the very large role played by Keck too in this, really uh, driving the field. And, and TMT is going to start with that technology base. This system for taking these uh, laser beams and getting them up the telescope and launched is being designed in China, at the, in Chengdu, China, by the Institute of Optics and Electronics. And I'm not going to go through the design, uh, but just to show you the international character of this. And the guide star lasers themselves, those of you who from LIGO know a little bit about lasers, if you're going to go buy a guide star laser today, a 20 watt, 589 nanometer, laser, you'd probably go to Toptica MPB. It's a German-Canadian consortium. Buy this laser. It's a Raman fiber uh, 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 laser. When I left LIGO, that was still considered a pretty esoteric kind of technology, but it's uh, now commercial products. Uh, but our Chinese uh, collaborators want to produce these lasers, and they're doing something that you're more familiar with, a neodymium YAG, some frequency uh, generation. Uh, and they are act they've actually gotten up to about 30 watts. Uh, and what they have. They have um, uh, relaxation oscillations and you know, the usual problems in developing a laser. This image here is actually of a test where, of a beam launched in China at one of their telescopes. And this is a guide star that they excited in the sodium layer. And so you can see some pictures from that test. So we're, we're doing this work in China. You can see on resonance and off resonance. So we really know it's a guide star. And when we look at the return light, we will look at them with sensors, wavefront sensors. And we've actually built a novel polar coordinate wavefront sensor. We want to have our image on as few pixels as possible so we can read out fast and have the lowest noise. And that's been prototyped at MIT Lincoln Labs. And it's kind of a novel piece, uh, piece of uh, technology. I'm not going to go through all the 
parameters of our instruments just to tell you that there are three instruments in, um, in our first light suite. There is a prospective set of additional instruments that will come in over the years and decades afterwards. And of course, since these are being designed, uh, we pretty much know what the design is. And these, of course, will be reopened to designers and competition and so on over the years. And in fact, science may drive the evolution of those instruments uh, in different directions. Just to show you a couple of solid models of these instruments, just, just to give you the scale of these things, uh, these are big for astronomy instruments, especially the seeing limit instrument. This is the uh, wide field optical spectrometer. It's being led out of U University of California, Santa Cruz, with a large, a large collaboration involved in it. Uh, the, the iris uh, in, infrared imaging spe spectrograph that uh, is our leading diffraction limited instrument uh, in TMT, and Anna Moore is a co-PI of it, uh, looks like this. It's also a fairly large and imposing device. And I just uh, thought I would show that you know, the design work, they're in the preliminary design phase, and uh, there's prototyping of some of the critical components in that. That's where that work is. And then the third instrument is an infrared multi-slit spectrometer that's actually a clone of an instrument built and delivered to Keck in February 2012. Uh, we have the same final focal ratio uh, as the Keck. Uh, that's, that was an accident, but it was noticed, I think, by Judy Cohen. And, uh, and so we're planning on uh, making a clone. There's some things that have to be changed to match it to uh, the n nature of our pupil and so on. Uh, but that will be cloned, and maybe Nick Canadaris is here. He's leading the effort on this, uh, on this instrument. Another part of the globalization is the observatory software. We need software for common services, telescope control, all of the things that have to do with processing uh, the, uh, the images and so on, and just a couple of screens of observatory software prototyped in India, work that will be divided between uh, here in the U.S. and in India. So that was one for... Uh, uh, for our, our uh, seeing limit, this is the seeing limit instrument, that's an, the AO instrument, just again to show you the international character of this. So a very different topic. Look at these miserable people in this room. Hawaii, that mountain, Mauna Kea, is a sacred mountain uh, to the Hawaiian people. And they're just not going to let you put a telescope up there uh, without some respect for the mountain and for their culture. And so when we were coming to our site selection process in 2008, we were studying mountains in Chile and Mexico and, and, and Hawaii, we did an environmental impact statement and all of the cultural things we had to do in Chile and got that through and signed off by the government. And we started that process in Hawaii with hundreds and hundreds of public hearings and uh, legal appeals and contested cases and so on. This is just one, uh, one picture that someone took looking at the hearing room while testimony was being taken at one of these hearings. And you can, there are people in here, I think Mike Bolte is one of our astronomers that people know is, here he is, from UC Santa Cruz. At the time, he was the director of the Lick Observatory. Uh, very contentious thing, but you have to be sensitive to the fact that this is in someone's ceremonial backyard, and we've worked really hard to do this, and we've gotten through the process. Our, our environmental impact statement was signed off in May of 2010 by the uh, governor of Hawaii. We got our conservation district use permit. I'll say a little bit more about it in a moment. There's me. I, I even got to be on television. But the most important thing about this picture is to show you what you wear when you do formal things uh, in Hawaii. And you'll see that uh, multiple uh, times. So we've gotten all of the permits we need. We're, uh, our, even our sublease was approved uh, a few weeks ago by the University of Hawaii Board of Regents. There still is one legal appeal that we're dealing with. In fact, there's a judge somewhere sitting in a room with all of the documents, and we're waiting for him to uh, uh, give his opinion on whether our permit was illegally granted. But I think we're, we're basically there um, in terms of permits. So. The project is ready, even from the permitting standpoint, to start the construction. There we are on Mauna Kea. For those of you who don't go to Hawaii very often, the TMT site is up there. That's where Mauna Kea is. Uh, Mauna Loa is there. Our headquarters will be not where the Keck headquarters are in Waimea, but down here in Hilo, where a number of the other astronomy uh, observatories have headquarters. It's, you don't want to spend too much time at altitude. And the design of the facilities, the enclosure is done. You can see, you know, solid models here of, of uh, cutaways, piping, and everything. Bid packages are ready to go out on the road building and the rough grading of the site. So if we started next month 
and started with this the digital contour map, we've got the whole thing all worked out, the whole construction sequence, excavation, pier and tunnel, uh, fixed enclosure, foundation slab. We really want to stay, we finished the geotechnical study, so we understand the competence of the rock below us, the uh, steel that holds up the dome, and the dome company, Dynamic Structures Limited, built a lot of the enclosures and domes in, uh, in, uh, in astronomy, has its design, they've passed final design, and they understand how they're going to do this erection at 14,000 feet, uh, what kinds of cranes and how, what kind of footprint they need. And that, when the ground is ready, they will build that enclosure, and on a certain day, the shell will be complete, and we'll be able to work inside and outside. So we'll be able to put the telescope together inside while we're building the other facilities outside. And Mitsubishi is working out how to do the construction inside. Look at this, this is a big crawler crane inside the dome, okay? And as the construction proceeds, you see cranes. This is a little bit like building a collider detector down in a, an underground cavern. So this has got to be very carefully worked out and scheduled so people aren't getting in everyone's way and done safely and so on. That's all been worked out. And then outside, the, while that's all going on, and all the traffic's going back and forth, and all the laydowns have to be planned, uh, we, we build these support facilities around that and can complete this. If we start next April and go at a technical pace, we can complete these facilities early in, in 2020. Uh, funding will likely slow us from that. The observatory costs $1.45 billion in then year dollars. And, uh, if we followed this schedule and had no funding limits, just went, we could be doing science late in 2022. That's a long way away, okay? But that's what it takes to build one of these things. Uh, we've been out on the mountain. We had enough permits behind us, so we've been out on the mountain, and uh, I did get to walk around with uh, backup alarms and bulldozers. That's me and the vest so they wouldn't squash me. Uh, and doing the geotechnical studies, and we now understand what's below us. And, uh, and there's no surprises, and the telescope will be good and stable on it. So let me come to this international collaboration. Another aspect that you have to understand is that Mauna Kea is in the Northern Hemisphere. There are, there's the European Extremely Large Telescope and GMT to be built in Chile in the Southern Hemisphere. This is the only one planned for the nor Northern Hemisphere. It's also rather centrally located between America and Asia, so it becomes an opportunity to build a a collaboration of Asian and American scientists. And uh, this does seem to be happening as we put together this partnership. Uh, and it's a uniting of uh, communities that hasn't happened before. And, uh, and, and uh, some of these countries are interested in it because of the very positive uh, impacts on their, uh, on their young people, as well as the industrial return uh, in their economies. So along with all the designing and prototyping and permitting and so on is the politics of putting together a collaboration. This is the governor of Hawaii. He doesn't look like the governor of Hawaii in Hawaii 5 -0. Okay, he's so actually a little guy. Um, but that's a bunch of us. There's Richard Ellis and Mike Bolte and, uh, and so on. A number of our board members from different countries. And like ALMA and high energy physics projects, board meetings happen in uh, all sorts of places. Tokyo, uh, sometimes in Hawaii. Notice the difference in the clothing. See, Tokyo. <laughs> Hawaii, it's just so easy to pack for those trips. You know, Delhi, this guy is the Minister, uh, uh, Secretary of Science and Technology of the Government of India. Look at all the, you know, ties and things. And IAU receptions like the IAU meeting in Beijing where we got to meet a lot of the community and, and celebrated. And so the, where are we? we? Of course, we need the, all these partners, governments to agree on the funding that we need. And the Japanese parliament, they're, they're in. They've, uh, awarded construction funds, and in fact, we're currently spending the second year of construction funds from Japan. So the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has been funding through University of California and Caltech most of the work that's gone up till now, okay? Most of the money that I've spent has come from, through, from the Moore Foundation through UC and Caltech. The Japanese have gotten on board now, and for example, this year are spending $28 million on construction on that design of the telescope structure and polishing mirrors and turning out the blanks. Um, Sri Kulkarni, who's here, has worked hard uh, with us to get India involved. And this is a picture of uh, the former Caltech president and our board chair, who's uh, Henry Yang, who's the chancellor of UC Santa Barbara, and Sri, who's not wearing a tie, Sri, uh, you know, uh, with the prime minister of India. So this got rather high attention in India. Now, 
you know, Sri likes to be put up on a pedestal. He's gone with me on some factory tours. This is him being elevated, you know. But in fact, he's a down-to-earth guy. He, he distributed and collected our hard hats on that visit, too. So he, he plays all kinds of roles with us in India uh, and doesn't wear a tie in any of them. Um, so India has made a commitment. It's rather firm uh, commitment. I think they have a cabinet vote or something that's got to happen in the next month. Uh, but the, the horsepower is there in the government. And it's been recognized in the uh, strategic dialogue between the United States uh, and India. So it's rather far along. Here's a picture of the kind of politics that goes on. The president of the University of California and the UC Santa Barbara chancellor with the vice premier of China talking about TMT and an India-China bilateral dialogue going on that talked about TMT as one of the focus areas uh, for their cooperation in science and technology. That's not the same as them signing a check yet. We, you know, we're, we're still working on all of that. And I've spent a lot of time in, with lawyers in the last few months and board members producing all the agreement documents. That by itself is quite amazing. When you build a big international collaboration around CERN, you have an infrastructure, a legal infrastructure around which you can organize. When you start ground up, you've got to create that. And it, the first thing you've got to create is a huge pile of documents that have all these, the party of the first part and party of the second part. And that's been going on. Where's the U.S. in all of this? It wasn't, okay. The U.S. Uh, is not a partner in this uh, and hasn't been uh, involved in TMT since about 2006. We, however, they invited a proposal to plan a partnership with them, which we submitted. And this is the front cover of that proposal. And of course, it's a very international uh, proposal. And in, in fact, they accepted that proposal. And we do have a five-year grant. We're working with the NSF. And that has provided the basis for them to plan how they would become involved and to make sure that the US astronomy community supported by the NSF uh, has a voice in saying what they want to do in science and helping us to shape the program. And that's in good, good form, good motion. Uh, so there are annual TMT forums. There, our Science Advisory Committee has now expanded to include US community members. And uh, there's actually international science and, and, and uh, development teams that have formed on different topics in astronomy and involving a lot of the US community members along with astronomers from these other countries. And I'm really quite impressed at how active the group is. So I think this is a, a bodes well, the NSF, is uh, along with our partners is uh, developing a good clear picture of how TMT might fit down the road into the US uh, program. So I, I finished a, here with this last picture. I've shown you the, the science, the technology basis, the internationalization, some of the politics behind this. And it's a little bit like putting together this jigsaw puzzle. I and the team are ready to build. And uh, these governments are talking. And it's uh, sometime in the next. Uh, two to 12 months, we'll know whether I can start digging up on that mountain, but we're ready and, uh, and ready to build this thing. Thank you. Thank you very much okay. for a very comprehensive talk, covering a lot of ground and a few of the questions. Did the US government help you in these negotiations with these other nations, like the State Department or others? Yeah, in fact, we had a recent letter uh, from the science advisor to Secretary Kerry that went to our partners uh, expressing uh, the enthusiasm, you know, pleasure at, at this. I mean, they haven't committed to putting money on it, but, they, but they've been supportive recently. They couldn't do anything until they decided to accept our proposal and, and, uh, and work with us to envision a U.S. role. But once they've done that, they've been a positive force. Uh, it's a, there's a linear drive, you know, uh, magnets and so on, and we are using hydrostatic bearings, yeah. Yeah. Export. Well, the, yeah. So if you, so you, you, what you're raising is the issue of uh, the Export Administration rules and ITAR, uh, traffic, and arms, uh, uh, traffic and Arms regulations. And so we, when we put this collaboration together, we, uh, we knew that was an issue. 
and we surveyed all of the technologies in TMT as we began to envision what our partners would get involved in and what kind of, as they say in the law, technical assistance we might have to provide. We surveyed that uh, rather rigorously. It turns out with, with, with Canada, Japan, uh, uh, there's no problem. Even India, with India, uh, the, uh, there were a few sensitive areas, but all we needed to do was get a letter from all the Indian institutions saying that whatever technology we export to them, they wouldn't export to the following list of countries. So that was simple. China presented a, a more difficult problem, and we were far enough along in our discussions with China that we understood the areas that they would uh, be involved in. And so we were able to look at the export, and we, first of all, we were able to conclude that we had no ITAR issues. And that's partly because we're not gonna involve any of our international partners in the infrared detectors. Now, they may get involved in the infrared instruments, but that's not new in astronomy. Uh, a lot of these observatories have infrared instruments and they're international, even Chinese partners in them. You just have to control the technology. So I, we, we, uh, supply, we applied for an export license with the Department of Commerce and uh, I treated this you know, kind of new mysterious thing as if I was gonna go to NSF and write a proposal. So we surveyed all the technologies and I went three times to the Commerce Department and the State Department and the Defense Department to meet with all their people and gave talks like this, but more detailed on what each institute's gonna do and pictures of what they're doing and pictures of what they've done, if they already know how to do this, you know. And the net result was we got a license, okay? And we were even asked, we're not sure we need a license uh, for a lot of this stuff, but we're, we understand you're coming here out of an abundance of caution. So we have a license, it ran for two years, it was renewed for three years, we're in the middle of it, and uh, we seem to understand how to deal with EAR and ITAR. So what, what we have is a document control center where every person who has access to it, we collect when they register their, what, what country they're from, if it's a US person or what nationality it is. And then we have a security system which takes an infinite amount of work to uh, make sure that documents that shouldn't be seen by country X aren't. And it really is only the Chinese that, you know, so you can't show certain things. But, and, and then we have to maintain an audit trail and and periodically be exposed to an audit on that. We haven't had an audit, but uh, I think we would survive one. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the involvement of the Japanese corporations that you mentioned. Are they contracted or are they collaborators? No, the, so, uh, no, they're making a profit. So the institution that is our collaborator or our partner is the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. I mean, I'm glib, so I just said Japan, but it's NAOJ. And uh, some of you know the people who built Tama, okay? Mitaka is the headquarters, same, same campus. They make a contract with Japanese government funds with Mitsubishi or Ohara or Canon to do the kinds of things that I've shown. Yeah. Right, uh, yeah, so, so there's a cost estimate for the construction, and when a partner says, I wanna do the tertiary mirror, we take that part of the cost estimate and put that in their column. This is really important, by the way, because if they contribute something, they earn observing rights, okay? And it's, there's only 365 of those nights a year. Uh, but the formula also includes an estimate of our um, operations budget, and the operations budget is about $27 million a year and another 12 to, to support instrument R&D and development and management of the instrument development program. So you take that and with the formulas, we integrate that over 20 years. And so if a partner is a 10% partner or a 20% partner in construction, the assumption is they'll contribute the same fraction to operations. And that becomes the basis for the observing equity that they earn. Yeah. Uh, it's been about two years forever. That's right. And we have dreams, if you read our original proposals and design documents of developing what we call durable coatings yeah. that might last longer. You might last five years. You can see the premium. We're going to be, I mean, the coating, the re stripping and recoating is right there in the support facility at nearly 14,000 feet. So we're not just operating an observatory, we're operating in a mirror factory. And there's a steady procession of mirrors in and out. Wouldn't it be nice if the recoding time was five years? 
So there's, there are people who are doing studies, Drew Phillips at UC Santa Cruz, of um, magic coatings, first of all, that go all the way down to 310 nanometers in the UV and are beautiful in the infrared. We don't quite have that coating. Uh, the astronomers don't want to stop at 340 nanometers. But then with all of those beautiful optical properties last five years instead of two, we're, we're not there yet. The good news is since you have to recoat the mirrors, that R&D, as it comes along, we can adopt it. And in designing our coating system, we're making sure that it's uh, versatile so it can accommodate any new coating magic that has to be done. Okay, thanks. thanks.